Hello everyone, this is Disgruntled Elk, and I am off cam, I'm actually getting over some sickness right now, so excuse my voice if it's a little, little off from normal, but I wanted to go over my top 8 finish in this last weekend's, um, I think it was the last weekend of April, yeah, the 28th, yeah, no, that's May, whatever, last weekend, um, I took, I, I made top 8 with the this list um blue white hammer of course i've covered in depth kind of why i made most of the decisions in previous videos so you know feel free to check those out the only difference i made uh between previous list and this one is we cut one lavinia which hurt my soul because i love that card i think it's fantastic and we cut one blacksmith skill for two hushbringer um so a lot of people were asking about hushbringer um so it's good against elementals, obviously, because, you know, flying lifelink, one, two for two, you know, it's reasonably costed, but creatures entering the battlefield or dying don't cause abilities to trigger. So, you know, it stops ETBs, so it's going to stop Solitude, it's going to stop Fury, it's going to stop Risen Reef, all that stuff, right? So that's great. But on top of that, the other big thing is it stops death triggers. So when we're looking at Yawgmoth and things like that... pull up young wolf when we're looking at things like that um undying so when this creature dies it had no counter on it return it to the battlefield under its owner's control so hushbringer stops undying triggers from happening basically right because when it goes to the graveyard it triggers and hushbringer stops that so hushbringer is really good at um, you know, it doesn't fully stop Yawgmoth from going off. They can sack a couple creatures to Yawgmoth to kill your guy, your Hushbringer, and then kind of go off. But it takes a lot more resources to do that. And generally in that matchup, I found that you can pressure their resources really effectively. They have to respect a lot of things going on. And so if you're able to kind of prevent their Yawgmoth from doing its thing immediately and kind of stretching things out. Maybe they have to sacrifice a couple more creatures than they wanted to. Then it's often difficult for them to go off, especially if you're pressuring their life total. Also, if you ever throw a hammer on this thing, uh, it, it can be very challenging for them to them to win. Cool. So that's kind of the thought process behind a couple Hushbringers. I like the card, but it just hasn't been at its best recently. But with the uptick in Yawgmoth, I'm kind of I'm kind of higher on it. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go over the um, the matchups this that I played this weekend, and then we'll go from there. Some will be kind of moto replays. Some will be the footage I recorded. I didn't do commentary at the time because uh, you know I didn't want to, but just wanted to record it for posterity. So without further ado, we're gonna kind of jump into round one. Cool. So we are here with round one. This is game one, and so kind of looking. Um, I'm not super familiar with a lot of Magic Online names, but looking at this hand, um, you know, we have Giver, we have Saga, um, and we have a White Source. Um, if we find any Equipper, this hand's excellent, um, or we might be able to just make Constructs. I don't know if it's a keep. It's pretty close. And so we actually mulligan because, yeah, I think we can just do better, right? The Saga's nice, but we can just do better. This hand is very medium as well. I think I throw it back if I'm if I remember right. No, we go ahead and keep it. Um, in retrospect, I think we probably throw it back. I like the nettle cyst as a follow up to the stone forge though. It's not a terrible hand, but it's um you know it's just not great either. So we don't know what we're against and kind of go from there. All right, so they played bobble and steam vents, which means basically guaranteed to be blue red merc tide. Um, So we draw Urza Saga, which is fantastic. We draw the Ornithopter. There's no reason to play out the Ornithopter because we can't both draw a Cigar Aid and a Hammer this turn. So there's just no reason to take the extra damage. Sometimes your life total does matter quite a bit. They play a Misty Rainforest after considering and binning a Ragavan. And we get to untap. So we get to play this sweet Urza Saga out. We get to run out this Stone Forge. If they counter it, they counter it. The next couple turns, we're just going to probably want to make Constructs anyway. But they didn't counter it. So what are we grabbing here? I end up grabbing a culture complete because I want them to start burning their removal now. And if they don't, then we get to put a culture in play. Uh, we also play out the Ornithopter because I want to start pumping the Urza Saga and the Nettle Cyst. And um, 
Yeah. I mean, we don't have to play out the Ornithopter, but very little reason not to as well. So they unholy heat the Stoneforge, which makes a lot of sense because they don't want to contest with a Cauldra. Cool. So they play a big old Murktide, 5-5, five, five, send out a huge one. But so we play out the other Ornithopter play out the land and the question is do we play out the drum we do play out the drum which turned out to be a horrible mistake because they do have the spell pierce if i remember correctly so i do pay for the spell pierce because we're not going to get the construct anyway um and then from there we're just gonna hope to get there with a saga token and a nettle cyst it's possible i was not supposed to play the spring leaf drum um but you know live and learn The other reason, of course, is we want to get the extra const we want to get the extra power and toughness for our construct. So having the extra artifact in play is relevant. Um, here I decide I can probably take five once. Um, I do go ahead and make a construct this time though. No reason not to. And we go ahead and grab a shadow spear. Um, it's gonna be very hard for this Murktide to race a construct with a shadow spear or just his deck in general. So obviously Archmage Charm is a problem, but I don't think we can play around it. So we go ahead, throw the, the Shadow Spear on the Construct token, um, and just pass the turn, of course. This thing's huge, which is great news. Um, and the reason I didn't put the Mantle on the Ornithopter and uh, tap it for mana last turn was because I think I'm planning on chumping here. I'm considering it. I decide not to. With the construct the way it is, it seems pretty unlikely that it will you know, necessarily need to happen. So we just go to combat. Keep it simple. Uh, they steal our guy, which <clears throat> was a, you know, a reality we knew about. So now we go ahead, play out this Stoneforge Mystic. We have the Cauldron in our hand, so that's, that's great. And I go ahead and grab the Colossus Hammer. It's possible right there we're actually supposed to grab the reality chip, but I really wanted to put the Shadow Spear on the Ornithopter just so I could move it off of the Construct. Um, also, because we don't have a lot of things that require a bunch of permanents in play other than the Nettle Cyst, which is going to be big enough anyway, um, I'm happy to kind of exchange this Ornithopter in for what's effectively six life. Okay, so they bolt the Stoneforge as they are kind of priced into doing. Play Mem Knight. And we decide to just go ahead and run out this Nettle Cyst. It resolves, which I'm kind of surprised about. It tells me that they likely have something along the lines of, um, you know, like uh, another Archmage Charm would be the, the one that I would expect the most. Um, we are probably just going to be blocking with this Ornithopter again. And I am keeping an eye on how many card types there are in the yard because this is a 6-6 right now. Um, it might be challenging for them to dump a bunch of cards in the yard to get Unholy Heat up to its full Delirium. And because of that, it doesn't matter if it's a 6-6 or, or a 5-5 five, five, or a 4-4. Four, four. It makes no material difference right here. I go ahead and throw the uh, Ornithopter under the bus. Uh, so they have another Archmage Charm for the Shadow Spear this time, which is kind of a problem um still have not drawn a single cigar to Zade or a paladin this game which obviously is not ideal um but we crack in for six which is pretty cool and then we get to move the nettle cyst over to the esper sentinel so now if they want to cast a non-creature spell they have to pay seven Cool. And so what we're seeing here is it looks like they're playing another Murktide. Um, and we're we're pretty dead. I think we're actually just dead on board. Well, no, we go to one, so whatever. <laughs> um, but we, we are dead. So kind of moving on from there, I'll see you back in game two. Cool, so we are back for game two. Let's see how we sideboarded. So we brought in the um, we brought in the three blacksmith skill. And we also brought in the Relic of Progenitus for three Ornithopters, the Springleaf Drum, and a Steel Shaper's Gift. Uh, we also brought in Pithing Needle um, for 
engineered explosives. I think you can take that or leave it, but because we are, in fact, um, we we are a little bit lighter on blacksmith skill, I think having the needle for EE is completely reasonable. Cool. So, go ahead and hide that. And I do like to bring in marches on the draw because answering their threats can be much more relevant. This hand's great. It has aid, hammer, and threats. Like, there are just a lot of things we can do with this hand. So, I'm just going to go ahead and go fetch for a basic planes because I am afraid of Blood Moon potentially post board. And they did mulligan to six as well. Okay, so they play out Ragavan, which is fine. They're tapped out. I'm just going to make them have it. Um, if they have... Um, if they have exactly Archmage Charm. Um, because the reality is they have to hit us, make the, con the, the treasure token, and then use the treasure token and the... Like everything they've got to Archmage Charm. They don't have it, so they're dead. Cool. That was that was a, a no-nonsense bonk game. Just like, hit you for 11. Also, we draw a card off the Archmage Charm because I don't think it's likely that they're playing 11 mana for that tax. So, go into game three. Cool. So, looking at our sideboard, we boarded out the extra Steel Shapers gift um, as well as the Cauldra this time. Cauldra, I'm always tempted to keep against this deck. I usually don't, but... On the play, I think it's a lot more reasonable, especially if you're able to keep the Steel Shaper's Gift. That being said, I cut the extra sh gift and the um, the Cauldra for the two March of Otherworldly Lights because we want a little more interaction on the on the draw, I think. Cool. So we mulliganed that hand because it kind of sucked. Um, this hand's much better because we have the Giver into Stone Forge, and we also have Versa Saga, so a lot of, a lot of tools to just get there. Uh, they did have a, a Ragavan on turn one. I will always trade off with a Ragavan on turn one because oftentimes the Murktai deck really only beats you if they can get a mana advantage um, just because then then their spells become much more efficient than yours. Um, unfortunately, they did have Dragon Rage Channeler into Bolt My Giver. Um, so, you know, not really how you want this game to start, but not not a whole lot you can do either. They grabbed the Springleaf Drum like a bunch of bullies and so Sigarda's Dizade, that's a nice draw. Um, so we go ahead, lead with Urza Saga, play out the Stone Forge. And the reason I'm actually leading with Urza Saga here is because I want them to play the Blood Moon if they have it. Um, also because I just want to get the mana, mana right now. And so we go Stone Forge and grab the hammer because we drew the aid. That kind of, you know, informed our decision here. Uh, they get to consider, so they get to surveil twice. Uh, they throw a Murktide into the yard, but then they keep the other card on top. Okay, starting off the turn with another Consider for a counter spell. A lot of stuff going on right here. Um, and so, like I said, I'm basically always going to trade off. We don't need this Stone Forge to stick around. We can just make Constructs the next couple turns. Um, I do go ahead and just play out the other Stone Forge as well. If they want a counter spell, they only have one card in hand. That's completely fine. Um, we go ahead and get another hammer. And then we just play out this fountain and shock it in. Our plan is just going to be Cigar Dizade into, into Bonk. And we have the blacksmith skill as backup as well. Cool. So on our end step, they are Archmage Charming drawing two cards. That's fine. Um, so they're back up to three cards. It's one of those things where we they, they know about uh one hammer i don't think they know about the other no they don't about both hammers um so this is scary uh it looks like they are casting a merc tide after casting another dragon rage channeler stupid spring wave drum it's a traitor so yeah big old merc tide they've gotten eight eight merc tide and triple dragon rage channeler this is not really where we want to be but you know, is what it is. Um, so we go ahead, float mana here, get a Shadow Spear, because I'm a big believer that if we can get Shadow Spear plus Colossus Hammer on a creature, it's it, especially one that costs more than one mana, so they can't Archmage Charm it, it's very difficult for them to win. And so 
I made the choice to use the floating mana and the extra one to equip to the Stoneforge Mystic. Um, this does leave me dead to something like an Engineered Explosives, or if they have like a Bounce spell on the Stoneforge, we're pretty stone dead. Um, I think a better line would have been, because we're at 15, and they only have 8, 9, 10, 11, it's tough, right? Because if they are able to... Because like they can throw the the land into the yard and if they do that then like then they only need one additional card type and oh well, i guess they only have murktides i think it's close i take the very aggressive line of just crack in i'm hoping they'll block with the murktide region um because they they only have one card so they can't force a negation me um and i go ahead and throw the hammer in we're going to gain 12 life here which is really relevant go up to 27 so we're definitely not dead this coming turn um but things could go wrong. Land. Uh, and they do play EE -E on two, which is horrifying. So I'm thinking, okay, they're just going to crack the EE -E on two, kill the Stoneforge Mystic, and then we're, we're, we're very likely dead, right? Um, especially since um, they're almost at Delirium as well because they can crack the EE. -E, that puts them to three card types. Um, that being said, they... Uh, for whatever reason, they choose not to crack the uh, the EE. Uh, I think this was definitely a misplay because Blacksmith skill is just becoming a lot more popular. You can already see what's going to happen. Uh, so we play our land. I can't believe I'm getting to untap. I crack in and they pop the EE, of course. And then we get to blow them out with Blacksmith skill on Stoneforge Mystic. And so EE -E is a very good card. Not questioning that. It's very good against us. But the reality is a lot of times they can't put it on one because it kills all their DRCs. And sometimes if they're playing Alpine Moon, Alpine Moon. Um, but with Blacksmith skill, oftentimes you only need to protect one permanent against EE. -E, and it's going to do that. And so that's why if I'm on the full four Blacksmith skills, I don't think you need to board in the, uh, the needle. But you're always welcome to board in the needle because the card is very good against us. All right, so I am 1-0. I will see y'all in round two. Cool, so round two, let's see what we are going on. We are playing against Will the Pill, not a name I recognize. We have double Cigar to Zay, double Stone Forge Mystic, and two lands. This is an incredibly easy keep. Um, opponent Mulligan to three cards, so as good as the hand was, it's much better now. Um, and we're just going to play out the Cigar Desade and the Ornithopter. And we do that, of course, because if we do hit um, hit a hammer, then we just immediately get to hammer. Or a Steel Shaper's Gift is effectively another hammer. Looks like we're playing against Tron of some type. I think it's probably um, Green Tron because of their willingness to mulligan so aggressively. Uh, we play out the Stone Forge. We're going to get a hammer here, of course. Um, and they, they just concede the game, which, fair enough, they mold the three. Like... Uh, Tron can win on a Mold of 3, but very unlikely when you're hitting them for 10 on turn 3, or potentially even more. Cool, so I will see y'all in game 2. There have been some fast ones so far. Cool, so we are back for round uh, round 2, game 2. Yeah, and so let's see how we sideboarded. We cut out the, especially on the draw against Tron, I really hate Esper Sentinel. Um, so I cut the Esper Sentinels, and I also cut the nettle cyst because it's very slow i do think you are actually supposed to bring in on the draw at least some number of blacksmith skills i think you can trim probably uh like reality chip at least for one um and we went ahead and brought in the two lavinias of course we also brought in the two spell peers i think both are very good um and then we brought in the uh pithing needle for nettle assist because they have a lot of things you can name uh blast zone oblivion stone and what's the last one uh karn the great creator is usually the other one i name but we haven't seen that of course let's see what happens cool um so we have cigar to Zade, uh saga and ink moth nexus ink moth nexus plus saga and the aid means that we will be able to turn four kill them very reliably um if we hit another colored source that means lavinia will keep them off of going too crazy and so i, th I think it's a reasonable keep here 
and they mulligan to six, then they mulligan to five. Uh, we do end up throwing the hand back um, because once we see they mull the six, we can probably go a little more aggressive. In retrospect, I think it's probably a fine hand to keep, but this deck can mulligan so freely that like going to six is often kind of free unless you're against a like thought seize inquisition uh, heavy removal pile deck um so yeah i think this is a a fine keep if we hit any of our equippers this hand's obviously insane and they mulligan to five then four so you know uh so only four this time not three um they play plant and star we go ahead, Sea Chrome Coast, Ornithopter, and we play the Shadow Spear. I'm holding the hammer as long as I can in case we get Cigar to Zade. Um, okay, whatever. We'll just go ahead, play out this Lavinia, and crack in for zero. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be upset if I didn't crack in for zero. You know, you got to send a message occasionally. Dang. I, I was terrible. What am I doing with my life? Perfect. All right, so they crack the star. Um, do they get Tron? No, they do. Nature's claim the Shadow Spear, which feels pretty aggressive, I'm going to be honest. Um, I think they were probably trying to hit like a uh, Sylvan Scrying, and so that was probably their only green source, um, but then they didn't want the green to, to lose, so blowing up that one's fine, I guess. Um, we're just going to get in with our incredibly mediocre beats. And no reason not to play out the Memnite, basically. Uh, they still just don't have anything going on. Uh, yeah, continue. Attack for three. This is a very strange game. Um, if Tron had a normal hand or just didn't mulligan to five, then we're probably not in great shape. I am keeping... Did I keep... Um, yeah, so the reality chip is still in the deck, so you can get value out of these fetches a little bit later. Um, but there's really no reason to not crack one of them, at least. Um, so Spell Pierce, that's quite good here. Uh, they're stuck on two lands. Even if they hit Tron, um, they can't Oblivion Stone us, really. I mean, they can, but okay. They're playing Basaju as a normal land. This is a good sign. Uh, Cigar to Zade, very good, of course. Um, because they didn't hit Tron, the Spell Pierce is going to be very live. And just crack in for three. Um, the reason to put the hammer on Lavinia here is because a lot of times Tron will have Warping Wheel, which exiles creatures with power or toughness, one or less. And because Lavinia is a nice rounded 2-2, she is immune to that. That being said... Um, so the nature's claim the hammer. That's fine. Yeah, we'll just crack in for three. And they're dead in three turns anyway, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, they also need to draw Tron and other pieces. All right, and so we draw one of our other, you know, you know six hammers. Um, plus we have the sagas if we need to. Yeah, so we're just going to hammer again. The game's over. Um, yeah, this one was not particularly interesting, but oftentimes the Tron hammer matchup is not very interesting anyway. So I will see y'all in round three. All right, we are back for round three, and let's see what we got. We are on the play, which is great to see. Against zero, huh? Um, yeah, we have Metalcraft and two hammers effectively with the steel shaper's gift or if we need to get something uh like a shadow spear we can get that as well or even a paradise mantle generates a ton of mana with this hand and then pure seal pattern of course is really just you know the chef's kiss um yeah so we just go double ornithopter and we do go ahead and play out the hammer here um you know it kind of sucks to give up the card from the paladin but this means we can actually hit them for 10 on turn two um, because it means that we can play the Paladin, we have the Metal Craft already, and they're Gigantha. And so Gigantha tells me it's probably potentially Tron, or like a Prowess deck, or you could also play Shadow, right? So like those are the three that come to mind. Um, Arid Mesa is an interesting one. Um, the Cigar to Zade for the extra, extra Equipper is really silly here. So yeah, we just go ahead... We're going to throw the hammer on the Ornithopter right here. And they have the bolt for the Ornithopter, which is a shame, but is what it is. Um, 
Yeah, we just we just pass the turn. We don't attack with Ornithopter there because if they do just have one land and like a Monastery Swisspear or something, we can just safely block with the Ornithopter and not risk getting blown out. All right, Manamorphose. We love to see Manamorphose pre-combat. Also confirmed it is prowess 100%. Uh, another Manamorphose. Uh, Soulscar Mage and Unholy Heat on our poor, poor Paladin. Cool. So if we hit a land here, we actually get to Aid, Gift, and Hammer. Um, Sentinel's not bad either. We just get to Sentinel plus Cigar to Zade. Of course, Sentinel is pretty bad against... Uh, against Soulscar Mage and just a pile of burn spells. I choose to get the hammer instead because they don't know about the aid. Um, I mean, they should probably be able to surmise that the aid is there, but all right. Yep, Manamorphose, do they wanna pay one? They do in fact wanna pay one. Um, and from there, they go ahead and lava dart the the poor Esper Sentinel, which is not great for us, and we get hit for three. But they are tapped out with only one lava dart in the yard. If they had two lava darts, we uh we would be in much much more trouble. Um, yep. So we're just gonna aid and hammer here. Hit you for ten, and then we're in the the fortunate spot of any spell and any land in our deck is a great draw um of course we don't really want to draw exactly cauldra but everything else is great because every spell of course we can cast and every uh every land we draw means that we can cast this nettle cyst and it'll be a four four all right so they crack in with the swift spear reckless impulse that's also very good Yep, cracking some, some baubles on us. And we take three here. We're hoping for a Shadow Spear or another gift would be amazing. Springleaf Drum's not really what we're wanting to see out of a spell, but, you know, is what it is. We crack in, they block so they don't die. You know, pretty, pretty simple stuff here. Um, and we do play out the drum. Uh, it builds the, it makes the Nettle Cyst bigger. Um, it also means that if we draw like a, a Memnite or another Ornithopter that we can cast the Nettle Cyst on uh, at any point because of aid. I remember letting out an audible Underworld Breach here because I don't know if this is stock, but I'm just not as familiar with the Red Prowess decks as I was. It seems insane. Like if I'm going to be completely honest, like it seems so good with Manamorphose and just like everything in the deck. Plus they get to Unholy Heat. Um, they're going to get to basically burn down the Ornithopter with double Unholy Heat, which puts us in a really bad spot. Um, luckily, we are at 13, so we have enough life to live through at least probably a turn or two. Um, they also only have one card in their hand currently. Um, that being said, they are having to eat most of their graveyard. Um, and then, yep. Yeah. So, I mean, they get to hit us for six here. Um, but they decide to pack it in. Um, I felt like that was a pretty um, early scoop. I think they should have at least waited until I had like a creature in play or something, but they were probably just frustrated. Um, so yeah, moving on to game two. I'll always take the Ws. Cool. So looking at the sideboard, we boarded out the Memnites because Lava Dart is a card. Uh, you want to reduce how many one one toughness creatures you have if possible i also cut the two esper sentinels because we're on the draw so it's just a lot less impactful than it would be otherwise also it's one toughness so that's not really great uh cauldra i cut because i don't think that stone forge is basically ever gonna live um and i think kind of like burn our best plan is actually like hammers and uh shadow spear and so this is one matchup where i do leave in all the gifts because gift finding shadow spear is really important um so what did we board out we boarded out well we boarded those in and then we boarded in the uh two spell pierces looks like three so all three um of the uh, blacksmith skill and then it looks like we also boarded in the relic because i am terrified of underworld bridge because that card is wildly powerful yep so that's kind of where we're at and so we're looking for a fast hand that can hopefully also suit up with um 
Shadow Spear. Uh, this hand's great. We have Stone Forge. It can get a hammer or a Shadow Spear. We also have three equippers, uh, two of which can't die to burn spells. Uh, plus the Paladin means that we're going to draw a card for free off this Paradise Mantle. All right, so they get to be on the play again. Monastery Swiss Spear. That's really powerful, of course. Get cracked for two. Not my favorite, but, you know, could be worse. Who needs a goblin guide? Let's build your own goblin guide. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, Cigar to Zade and pass the turn. Would have loved to see an ornithopter there, honestly. Because then it acts as an actual Birds of Paradise. Yeah. So. Dragon Rage Channeler. I think that card's probably insane in that deck as well. Um, yeah. Take a pile of damage. By pile, I mean one. It's a very small pile. Um, and so they're leaving up a mana. I like going Urza Saga here. Um, and then just playing out this Stoneforge Mystic. And I like going Saga here. So next turn, I can either make Constructs, or if they tap out, I can jam Paladin um, and potentially hit a uh, hit like a hammer or a rather I can also hammer and so we hope to hit like a, a zero drop um, off of our draw spells yep so they wisely just kill the stoneforge mystic they're going to need to do that anyway to get through but doing so on our turn lets them set up their draw step so they are cracking in that's fine uh, they're not pressuring us like they need to. Uh, we will eventually just go way over the top. And because they don't have white mana, we don't need to worry about deflecting palm. Yeah. So we're just going to pass the turn, I believe. Yep. No reason to do anything else. This Steel Shaper's Gift is going to be fantastic. Um, and this, we're, we're about to see the reason why you really can't give the hammer deck just infinite time when you're only attacking for you know two three points of damage a turn make a construct on their end step i could have made the construct and blocked the dragon rage but if they are able to throw anything else into the arm if they're able to surveil over a creature or a sorcery then our construct dies for no reason and i think it, it's it can do a lot more good so we're actually just going to float mana because we can hammer the construct in response to something uh, we get a hammer to force the action. Um, they go ahead and bolt in response. We, of course, this is something I had to get used to on Moto. Make sure all their triggers resolve before you make your next move. So we flash in another hammer. Okay, they are now tapped out. This will die, but it means our Pure Seal Paladin is, um, is good to go. And because of Paradise Mantle, we're also just going to get to draw a free card off of uh, off of our Paladin. Yep. Let's play out the Paladin. Play out the drum. Or the uh, the cape. We got some swag going. We get to draw a card. Ingmoth Nexus, that's not bad. That means they're just dead next turn. Uh, and we're just going to throw everything on the Paladin, of course. Because there is no reason not to make a 2222. And the Steel Shaper's Gift, once again, like, people kind of poo-poo this card, and I get it. In a lot of like post-board scenarios, you don't really want it. But when an equipment like Shadow Spear or killing very quickly by getting another hammer is really important, there's very few cards that do it better. This is just better than Stone Forge Mystic in those matchups. Okay, so there you go. Manamorphose. I have no idea what they're trying to find. I'm just thinking, okay, maybe a Shattering Spree. That's the only thing I can think of that they're really looking for. Um, don't think there's enough that they can do. Um, since we have the, the Steel Shaper's Gift, it means the game's over. Yeah, so they just crack in for three. We take the three in the air, and uh, this game is over. We're just going to go ahead get the shadow spear we're just gonna make it really quick yep and throw it on there we get to draw a card too it's really dumb 
everything's everything's super dumb uh, and we're going to be attacking with a 23 23 trampling lifelink creature but you know why not throw out the esper sentinel for value <laughs> yeah and they have four toughness we have 19 power trampling over that four toughness plus we gain 23 life right like this game's over but yeah um so i think that really one it points out that you can't just try to kind of control all of hammer's creatures unless you really do have like answers to uh, both saga and all of the creatures but yeah um i will see y'all in round four okay so we are back for round four let's see what we got we're against uh broken pot cb um cool so yeah my opponent said hello good good luck have fun uh you two i immediately assume my opponent's gonna try to combo kill me but they're also a yorian deck so i'm really confused um but this hand's great it has stoneforge into sneaky cauldra as well as urza saga is kind of the turning point right if we just have this then it's probably not a keep but because we do have the urza saga to follow up it's uh it's looking pretty good we're actually holding the marsh flats up because my opponent might not know what we're on and there's no reason to run out the ornithopter quite yet cool so birds of paradise so realize we're probably not going to die uh quickly anyway yeah, I do realize they are likely a Magus of the Moon deck, though, potentially. So I get the the planes. Um, and we're just going to go ahead. And we Ink Moth here um, because... Why did we get Ink Moth over Saga? I don't feel like there was a, a huge reason to. We go ahead and get Hammer here. Um, I think I'm hoping to spike a Cigar to Zade off the top, but I don't think that was correct. Um, this day was definitely not my tightest play. But, you know, sometimes when you uh, when you draw good and your opponent's bulk into three and four, like, you don't have to draw that well. All right, so they make us the moon me. Um, <laughs> so, thankfully, this is a saga safe in our hand. It would have been nice to draw a land at some point, but, um, yeah. So we get to Cauldre them, which they understandably did not play around. Um, so this is a situation where I really like having this line because now every time we play Stoneforge Mystic, they have to be kind of concerned that the Cauldre might just be in our hand um, and they, the Stoneforge becomes much more pressing of an issue. Um, so we have real pressure on the opponent. They're abundant growthing. All right. So they are also missing land drops. Um, they are a Yorian deck, so I'm very excited about these Hushbringers in the board. Giver of Rune's not really what I'm wanting to see, but whatever. Um, and we're holding up the Stoneforge here because we can put in Nettle Cyst, of course, to, to block the Magus. I'm kind of hoping they don't think about that. So they're solituding here, which is kind of super gross, but, you know, that's what it is. They are choosing the Stoneforge first. I was definitely supposed to let the ev Evoke resolve first. But I don't think it made a difference because they were absolutely just going to ephemerate anyway. Because uh, it's not like they're not killing. Uh, so, yeah, so they're just going to um, kill the Cauldra on their next turn. The reality is it doesn't really make a huge difference. Yep. Um, so they're going to rebound, exile the Cauldra. It's kind of kind of a huge problem but you know it is what it is um unfortunately we are continuing to not hit any white sources we could have hit a uh, drum a mantle would have also been great um at this point we're getting the mantle for exactly that reason we're gonna go ahead and put it on the stone forge past the yeah i get in here because I would rather get the Solitude off the board rather than giving them another couple turns to potentially rebuy it with, um, you know, another Ephemerate or something like that. It's worth trading off the the Germ from the Nettle Cyst. So unfortunately, they're able to get a Skyclave Apparition here, which means we're going to continue not to have two white mana. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Perfect, so kind of moving forward. Um, perfect, now the Ursa Saga, not really what we're wanting, but you know, whatever. We'll go ahead, put the Nettle Cyst on the Esper Sentinel, so at least they have to pay five if they have a, uh, a normal removal spell. Uh, 
Uh, prismatic ending, so at least we get to draw a card. All right, so if we have a, uh, if we draw a white source, the game's over because we get to put Cauldra and Nettle Cyst on the Paladin. We're gonna take four, and we still have a ton of time. All right, well, we draw Esper Sentinel, not my favorite. Um, Eladimer's Call, that's kind of a problem. Um, it would have been less of a problem if we had just drawn the second white source because um, then if they have to get a Solitude, then they will be empty-handed. So we have good follow-ups after that. But um, yeah, looks looks like we're pretty dead because they go Eternal Witness and then they start Ephemerate locking us. They're going to be able to Ephemerate Skyclave, eat the Esper Sentinel, and then Ephemerate Witness on the second Ephemerate to get the Ephemerate back, and they're just going to do that for every turn of the game. They can also just start getting Prismatic Endings. Um, like I'll, I'll just skip forward a couple turns so you can see. They have the Solitude as well. They can start getting Solitude back. It's uh, really bad. This this game is over. <laughs> yep. And so they ephemerate the witness. Yeah, it's kind of getting out of control. Um, and I will save us all the trouble. Um, uh, and I will go ahead and see you in the next game. We definitely lose here. All right, so we are back. Let's see what we got out of the sideboard. So we boarded out the Esper Sentinels because they are mostly a creature deck and the Memnites because the Memnites get blocked by everything and they kind of suck. We also boarded out the Steel Shaper's Gift because there isn't any particular equipment I'm really wanting as well as a Spring Leaf Drum because I think that can be pretty grindy. Um, so we boarded in the Lovinios because it's great. It counters a rebounded Ephemerate. It counters any of the... Uh, evoke elementals that they're casting it's fantastic it also means that sometimes they can't cast their non-creature spells if birds of paradise is being used to kind of ramp into it um, we brought in the marches of otherworldly light because that card is a removal spell and that's important um, we also brought in the hushbringers of course because it stops uh, ewit any of the evoke elementals as well as it's a yorian deck so it stops that um, let me see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. We also brought in the blacksmith skills and the relic of progenitus because we do know they are an Ewit deck. And so, yeah, that's the, that's the plan. I might've overboarded, but I think the cards we cut were all kind of bad. So let's, uh, see what we get. Cool. Um, the sand's like pretty pretty good but this cauldron is rough they're a blood moon deck so it's probably not a keep and this hand unfortunately is also a mulligan because we can't keep a one lander i don't think it's a keep did i keep this okay good <laughs> i did not keep this um so yeah we have protection as well as double stone forge mystic and lands so we keep this hand um we're definitely going to want lands, and we have the, the basic planes, so we just go ahead and keep Double Stone, Forge Mystic, and Blacksmith skill, um, and kind of go from there. Cauldra is very good in the matchup. They have lots of ways to kill it, but we have ways to move it, and if they don't have one of their ways to kill it, they're probably going to die. Basically, in these kind of matchups, I want as much kind of independent raw power as possible, because if you can pressure them very quickly, these decks usually have a lot of trouble kind of keeping up. It's also nice that Skyclave Apparition can't really deal with Cauldre at all because it can only take uh, take non-tokens that cost four or less. And Cauldre costs seven, despite what Stone Forge Mystic would tell you. Cool, so we got the Cauldre, of course. They are very likely to kill the Stone Forge if they, uh, if they can. Cool, all right. So we do not play the Cigar to Zade here because there's like really not a reason to, right? We put the Cauldre in. Putting the, holding this Blacksmith skill up is excellent because it means even if they have a removal spell for the Cauldre Germ, then we can protect it. Uh, we crack in for five, but we don't. We skip through combat. I think I clicked through it. It was really frustrating. So they would be at 12 right now. This even gives them time to get the Bant Triome. Okay. And so, yeah, our plan is just crack in for uh, five or six repeatedly. All right, yeah, so Cigar Dizade plus Hammer, like, <laughs> they, they would be dead. Um, yeah, so this is pretty unfortunate. 
Um, so they go to kill the stone forge. I say that's fine because we care about blacksmith skill or about the, uh, the cauldron. So they do have the ephemerate unsurprisingly. Um, and we do get to blacksmith skill the germ, of course. And this is pretty unfortunate because if they were at 12, then this hammer means that they would have to have another removal spell or they die. Um, but uh, we, we of course, did not attack last turn. We, uh, we clicked through it, which kind of broke my heart. Um, so yeah, they take 15 here, go to 2. Um, I'm inclined to believe they did not have a removal spell right there because if they did, they likely would have cast it. They rebound the solitude and we uh, we gain 15, so that's cool. But we're really behind. They have an active solitude and they are putting Yorian into their hand. All right, so Hushburger is not bad. Um, unfortunately, the Stoneforge Mystic won't trigger. But I think shutting off the Yorian is that important. And so this is a kind of matchup where it is a consideration to potentially keep some of the Steel Shaper's gifts for some of the Stoneforge Mystics. But I don't think you want to board out your Stoneforge Mystics in a matchup where you're keeping Cauldra in. Reality chip, not super exciting because, of course, the reality chip is a creature, so it will be hushed. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, this is just unfortunate. I don't know if they had the removal spell at the time, but of course we we would have been able to get there. They do have the Hushbringer, uh, or they have the Path to Exile for our Hushbringer, so things are about to get wildly out of control. <laughs> uh, no blocks, of course. So I do think I was supposed to play Reality Chip instead of Stoneforge, simply because the next turn we can always move the Reality Chip if needed, but we are just much better off if they kill the Hushbringer, if our Stoneforge is still in hand rather than the Reality Chip. Okay, so they get another removal spell. This is just really, really tough to kind of come back from. And this is a matchup where, you know, Hushbringer would be fantastic. So, yeah. Um, and I will save us all some time. I can kind of skip forward a little bit, but uh, we are basically dead. Yep, so we flash in the chip to block the solitude. They cord for a restoration angel. I just go ahead and pack him in. But yep, so unfortunate way to lose that round, but you know, that was only game two and we would have win game three as well. So I will see y'all in round five. Obviously things turn back around for Cool. All right, we are back for round five against a name I certainly cannot pronounce, so I'm not going to try. Um, and this hand is, like, it's pretty insane. So we're going to keep. Um, obviously, a second land would be nuts, but the fact that we can turn one cigar to Zade into Memnite. And so the reason I do, I lead with the aid is because if they have something like Prismatic Ending, we want them to hit the, the cigar to Zade when we have two more. Yep, so portable hole, cool. They hit that. Um, and so, yeah, go ahead, get our hollowed fountain, play out our Stoneforge Mystic. Um, and this is definitely a matchup. It's probably the like Oswald Fiddlebender or Urza, like blue white deck. Um, and so, we want to kill them. We want to kill them fast. Yep, so we're just going to get the hammer um, and then kind of go from there. Esper Sentinel is pretty obnoxious, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> but we kind of go from there. So yeah, we go Cigar to Zade. We don't care. I'm going to let them draw a card. Did not expect the Metallic Rebuke game one, but here we are. And so we play the third Cigar to Zade. And that's kind of why we were so aggressive, because it doesn't matter. We have three of them. And we're, we're hoping that they don't have another, um, <laughs> another portable hole, but... It is what it is. So they go get Sword of the Meek, which means we could potentially be dead next turn if they have land Urza. So we draw planes. We uh, Steel Shaper's Gift. We let them draw another card because this turn we plan on uh, double hammering. So we could have gotten... Um, we could have gotten Shadow Spear there, which was probably correct because 
getting in there with both um like putting a hammer and a shadow spear on a creature is a huge problem um also shadow spear means this nettle sis is actually doing a lot of work um the reality is i also wanted to make sure that they had to block both creatures because of course if they only block one then we throw two hammers on the other um and now i'm kind of clearing their board so it makes their urza a lot less good actually takes at least one man off the board so they have stopped her foundry and this is the reason i think getting shadow spear was actually correct because we knew about the sword of the meek and if they are a sword of the meek they probably already have the thopter foundry otherwise they're realistically probably getting a cauldron or something yep so we crack in yep make a dude it blocks and we are going to get to flash in this nettle cyst as a one two three four five six six just a three mana six six um i keep poo-pooing nettle cyst because it's so often just so medium but there are times when the card's just very good um and i think that's why it's probably worth playing as as a one of it's just a body by itself um all right so sword of the meek they can start making three then five creatures a turn luckily we do have this urza saga that's about to go off um in two turns so it can get a shadow spear Yeah, and so we are choosing not to uh so something to keep in mind is if you want your if you want the creature to be like if you want the germ no matter what always put the living weapon trigger uh first on the stack because then your cigar to say triggers will resolve first if you want to equip it then you put the cigar to Zaid triggers uh, on the bottom because you need your germ to resolve first otherwise it'll um equip and then it'll pop off because the the germ will be attached to the um the equipment as well all right so they're making a dude making a dude making a dude and they're just gonna block with all three um and so something to keep in mind also is thopters are blue so giver of runes will let us punch through as well and considering um they are one hammer hit away from being dead basically uh yeah that's pretty good Yep, so they have to block all three or they die. We're going to go ahead and play out the giver, and then we're going to make a large construct. I believe it'll be a 5-5. Five, five. All right, Ingenious Smith, that's fine. Um, it's obnoxious that I can't get through by just going pro blue. Portable hole, that's pretty good. Yep, taking a Memnite makes a lot of sense. But the problem, of course, is the Shadow Spear coming out of the Saga. It's pretty good. And now that the giver is up, all right, we got a pure seal paladin. So that means we are not going to make a construct. Um, we got the shadow spear. We're going to throw it on the uh, the stoneforge mystic because we can always move the germ to the stoneforge mystic. Or move the, uh, that animal cyst, of course. Yep. So we just get to go paladin. Uh, opponent briefly disconnected. Metallic rebuke. That's fine. We're just going to go ahead and use the extra mana to move the nettle cyst over for a very lethal attacker a 19 power lifelink trampler and might as well crack in with the 552 five, right for good measure cool all right so we will see you in round uh round two or game two one of them all right we are back for round or for game two of round five i want to say uh so we trimmed an esper sentinel um because i think it's kind of slow um we're also on the draw mem knights are pretty atrocious in this matchup i would assume um and cauldra or we we also trim the nettle cyst because even though it was fine in that matchup or in that game i don't think it's generally going to be very good against the you know endless stream of blockers um you could board in relic here i didn't really want to though because i it's pretty hard to break up a thopter sword combo with a relic so we also cut the steel shaper's gifts because we don't really need any specific piece of equipment and so we brought in, as well as a spring leaf drum, and then we brought in the, um, we brought in the, let's see, so the two spell pierces, the one, two, three blacksmith skills. We also brought in pithing needle because that is much better at stopping the uh, combo they have with Thopter Foundry. And then we also brought in two additional cards. I'm trying to remember what they were. 
Of course, they were the marches because marches answer uh, both parts of the combo as well as just random blockers. And they also block or they also stop the portable holes, which are great. So yeah, that's kind of how we board. And let's see what happens in game two. Um, I also haven't played this matchup a ton. Imagine that. Um, and so pretty, pretty flexible. This hand is fine, but not great. The double hammer is not really something I'm excited about. So we throw it back. Um, this hand, unfortunately, we can't cast any spells besides the Springleaf Drum. Uh, and we don't have a second land. So pretty easy. Uh, this hand, like, quite good. Unfortunately, it is a five. So we just keep the Stone Forge, the Hammer, and the uh, Scard is a hope we're getting there. We're shocking in the Hollowed Fountain because, of course, we do have Spell Pierce now. So there is reason to shock early and then leave up blue later because it doesn't just dead give away that you have... Um, that you have the the counter magic. Okay. Yep. Run it out. Stoneforge Mystic. Let's do the thing. We get Reality Chip here, of course, because Reality Chip plus the Guard is A. Uh, two mana future sites, like pretty powerful. Okay. Talisman. Sure, sure. And no attacks. Interesting. And so I think this was a really bad attack on my part. Um, not really bad, but if they have, um, like, I just, I think it was better to activate Stoneforge, put in Reality Chip on the Stoneforge, and then go from there. Because I don't think getting the Ingenious Smith off the table does that much. And because we know they have counter magic from game one, um, we know we can just get blown out, right? And so... This is not great. Um, we get blown out. I don't think I needed to get blown out like that. Um, probably just not super familiar with the matchup. And so, you know, live and learn. Never doing that again. Uh, but yeah. So, a second Ingenious Smith. Sure. It's, uh, it's a card. Portable Hole. It's it's good, right? Because it stops Cigar to Zade. Of course, we have another one. Because in this match, we've somehow had just infinite Cigar to Zades. Um, so, we're hoping to hit any cheap creature here would be great. Um, we do not find one, um, but, you know, is what it is. Um, and, of course, we don't fetch because we want that Colossus Hammer. There we go. Opponent's playing a Nettle Cyst. That's a, a big old, big old boy. Um, having multiple fetches with a reality chip in play, even though it's not attached to anything, is quite good because it lets us kind of fix our draws a little bit. Um, yep, yeah, and we're just going to try to play a defensive hammer here. We're just going to block and then try to put a defensive defensive hammer down, make it a very large wall. Sword of the Meek, sure, sure. They don't have Thopter Foundry, so we're still in fine shape. Yep, yeah. all right. Yeah, put a hammer on something. Of course, we can play more than enough for metallic rebuke march of otherworldly light i will go ahead and pack it in though i just want to see what i could draw next all right let's redraw again and of course we're dead now to, to combat damage anyway but i don't think there was anything we were drawing cool all right so game three i'll see you for game three Cool. So we are in game three, should be anyway. Um, on the play, I like Esper Sentinel quite a bit more. So we actually trimmed a giver um, to keep the one Esper Sentinel. I think that's the only change we made. Is this correct boarding? I don't know, but we're, we're going to find out. Cool. So uh, this hand's great. This hand's like both. It's fast and it can grind with the Saga and the Pure Seal Battle. And this hand's just excellent. It's not the fastest hand in the world, but I also don't think you need the fastest hand in the world. And we just drew a blacksmith skill. Like, this is insane. And so the reason we don't lead with Urza Saga on turn two there is because we are going to want to use basically all of our mana over the next couple turns. So now if they, if they say, have a removal spell for the Stoneforge, now we don't have to decide between making a construct or expanding our board um, through playing more spells next turn because we can just go Saga, play Stoneforge, leave up Blacksmith skill, and then we can Cauldre them. Okay. 
Of course, sometimes you don't need the blacksmith skill. You can just put in the cauldra. Um, and this is a fun little interaction. So we had to make sure we put our living weapon trigger um, on the stack second because then we get our germ, but now we get to move it to the Esper Sentinel, crack in for six with a, you know, just a giant taxing effect. And it means any spell they're casting, any non-creature spell each turn is going to draw us a card. Like, yeah, cool, Spring Wave Drum draws a card. Um, and, and this game is effectively over because of the blacksmith skill. Like there's very little the opponent can do. You know, it's bad when your opponent isn't who has like Urza Saga onto isn't actually using that mana. Yeah. So we're just going to get a hammer. Um, they can't metallic rebuke us right now because they just don't have the, the right combination of permanence. Um, they are not blocking, and so we're just going to kill them. I guess we'd kill them even with uh, even if they blocked, because it would get through for exactly 14. Yep, Path to Exile. We are going to go ahead and Blacksmith Skill for the win. That's why, you know, like, I would love to fit four Blacksmith Skill in the deck right now. I just don't know what I would cut from the sideboard for it. And so, yeah, just play the Blacksmith Skill. It's really good. It'll win you a lot of games. Kind of go from there. All right, cool. And I will see y'all in round six. Yeah, we are uh, four and one going into round six. So that's that's a pretty good spot to be. All right, so we are back for round six. Let's see what we get. Zenawan, I do not know that name. Um, and unfortunately, this hand is a mulligan. Uh, this, however, hand is quite good, right? So it's not perfect, but we do have Asper Sentinel, we can steal Shaper's Gift for a Paradise Mantle if we want to get a second white source going. Uh, Nettle Cyst, we're on the play with Esper Sentinel. Like, I usually have a hard time throwing back hands, especially if it's on my six, where I'm on the play with Esper Sentinel. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a hammer and a quip or two. It's just, there's a lot of things going right with this hand. It doesn't, I don't think, look as impressive as it actually is at first glance. Yeah, so... Fet Shock, Watery Grave. All right. Stitcher Supplier, Double Narc Amoeba. Okay. Um, well, it's a good thing this hand is powerful, and it can find at least a Shadow Spear, if not a Hammer. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So this is an interesting spot, and I think you could potentially make the argument for a Hammer. That being said, I really like getting a Paradise Mantle here because I think one of our best things we can do is get Paradise Mantle, play it, equip it to the Esper Sentinel. We can also play the Giver of Runes. And now our Paladin can potentially generate a ton of mana. Um, I also don't think there's a world where winning this game where we don't resolve Paladin. So, yeah. So I think right now we're kind of looking at the spot where we need to... Um, we, we need to Shadow Spear through. Um, hopefully with an Ink Moth uh, or get them with an Ink Moth kill. Um, they have Creeping Chilled us twice now which is, you know, less than fortunate. Um, we need to keep this Giver of Runes alive. I also don't particularly want the Stitcher to go into the yard. Um, okay. So that's uh, that's what we call a good draw. So we're able to play the Paladin. Um, and so I'm thinking right now, what else can we do? We're definitely not attacking this turn. And so question is, what else are we doing? Um... And I think I just miscounted for a second, not thinking, oh, this is the third artifact because sometimes Esper Sentinel throws me off. Um, but uh, that was definitely incorrect. I will say it was, it was certainly incorrect um, to not play the hammer there. Um, I think the only consideration I can have for not playing the hammer there is we need to bait them into attack with all of their Narc Amoebas. I think this is actually the thought process. So the only way we're winning this game, because we're at eight, they've hit, you know, multiple creeping chills. They're super far ahead on board. We can't really block with the Pure Seal Paladin. We can hopefully bait them into a big attack. Hopefully they don't have any more flyers. And then we tap the Esper Sentinel to play Colossus Hammer move the mantle to the giver, animate the ink moth with the giver, move the hammer to the ink moth, and then move the uh, paradise mantle to the pure steel paladin, tap it again to animate the ink moth nexus. Of course, if we hit a land, that means we can also give 
the Ink Moth Pro Blue with the Giver, because we won't need to tap the Giver, which will win the game as well. Sorry, I don't know why I'm, I'm you know, pooping on my own strategy. Hammer is also a good draw, but the real card we need right now is either the, uh, you know, the trap card where my opponent makes a bad attack. Um, unfortunately, they hit this wonder, <laughs> which means all their creatures fly. So our plan to quote unquote get them is not going to work. So we're taking five in the air. We need a hero. We need like a, a shadow spear here, like really badly. And... Stoneforge Mystic. Okay, cool. So this is going to be an instance where we see just how powerful Paradise Mantle is as a one of, and it's why you should always play at least one Paradise Mantle. I don't think I would ever play two, but I don't hate it either. So because this Paradise Mantle is going to generate three additional mana, whereas Springleaf Drum, of course, only generates one. So yeah, we, we're going to draw cards first to see what we can spike off the top. Okay, Ink Moth. Yep, yep. Okay. So we play out the Stoneforge Mystic. And of course we're getting Shadow Spear because we really don't want to die. It's not not the plan. Yep. So we get the Shadow Spear. Put the Shadow Spear on the Pure Steel Paladin. Then we get to use the the, the giver. Put the hammer into play. Draw off the hammer. And then attack with a 23-23 lifelink trampler. And trying to do the math, I think there's if they hit multiple Venge Vines off of their next mill, then they can win the game if they also hit both creeping chills left in their deck. But I don't think they can they can win. Like, of course, if they had hit the creeping chill, the third creeping chill exactly there, we lose the game, but not not much we can do about that, right? So we are going to go back up to 26, which is pretty huge. They uh, they do block with 5 toughness, so they go to 1. Then we move the Colossus Hammer, and we get to move another Colossus Hammer. Um, and I do that because it's very easy to move a Shadow Spear, and any equipped creature with a hammer can probably kill the opponent if it can get the Shadow Spear. But if they're able to kill the Paladin somehow in Game 1, maybe they have like you know, some random removal spells, then we can still win the game by just attacking with, with two large creatures, one of which carrying a uh, uh, Shadow Spear. Yep, and that's the game. So, Paradise Mantle, thank you. You, uh, I know your, your back is tired from carrying me, but here we are, and I will see y'all in game two. Cool, so we are back for the second game of round six, and here's how we boarded. So we cut the four Esper Sentinels, because I don't think they're very good, especially on the draw in this matchup. Um, we also cut the Nettle Cyst and the Memnite. Nettle Cyst is just not going to be getting through for a relevant uh, you know, use, and then Memnite's just, it's, it's a small body that's going to get blocked. Um, it is free, so it lets us go a little bit faster, which is nice, but uh, that's about it. So we brought in the three Blacksmith skill, as well as the two March. Um, we also brought in the Relic, of course, because it's a graveyard deck. Um, I liked the Blacksmith skills a lot because if we can protect Shadow Spear Hammer, much like against normal Dredge, um, the opponent usually can't win because you just go way over the top of them. Uh, the Marches I like because they can kill uh, either Stitcher Suppliers, but more importantly, they can na nab the Crabs. And the deck has a lot more trouble going off without the crabs. And then the Relic of Progenitus, of course, you know, it nukes their graveyard. Then that's really good because it's a graveyard deck. Cool. All right, so let's see what we got. Um, so looking at this hand, it's insane. This hand's insane. We have two mana. We can play out the... We can play out Drum, Memnite, Colossus Hammer on turn one. And then turn two, we can play Pure Steel Paladin. Um, and if we draw a land, we can also hold up Blacksmith skill. Uh, it's, it's, this hand's nuts. <laughs> this hand's very, very good. Uh, and our opponent will get to five. So, you know, good, good spot to be. Perfect. So they go fetch shock. All right. Creeping chill us once. Um, 
and all right cool so land so we just get to do this without taking as much damage um and so we because i hit the land i don't need to play the hammer because we can just play the hammer next turn right stitcher supplier is fine they hit another creeping chill which i'm not super happy about um, I get to play a little more conservatively than I normally would because they're on their, like, multi-five, right? Um, okay, cool. Stoneforge is great. We are going to shock that in because I'm not in much, you know, much danger. We're going to play the Paladin, and we're just going to pass the turn. There's no reason not to just hold up Blacksmith skill this whole time. I don't attack because I don't want them to get the free cards in the yard. Cool. So they play another Stitcher Supply. This is fine. Uh, they creeping chill us again. They've hit three creeping chills in the top 18. That's terrifying. Uh, but here we are. Cool. And Cigar Disaid is very good as well, of course. We don't need it um, because this... Um, yeah. They're, they're only holding up blue-green. So it's potentially correct to just do nothing in case they have like spell pierce because the reality is if we get if we crack in with hammer and shadow spear like the game's over and i don't think there's a combination of cards that they can play right now that win the game yep cool so play the hammer Yep, play the Shadow Spear. Draw a card. And yeah, let's let's get in there. And the reason I'm putting it on the Pure Seal Paladin, of course, is we gain more life, basically. It's pretty simple. Um, also, Pure Seal Paladin isn't an artifact, but uh, Blacksmith Skills got us covered either way. And they hit the fourth Creeping Chill, which is gross, but ultimately fine because we we have a pretty dominant board position and we do move the hammer to the stone forge um kind of for the same reason as last game where we can keep multiple creatures large we can also block with the stone forge in case they somehow go off with multiple venge vines um in reality in this matchup i think it was correct probably to board out like reality chip um but also i don't think it makes a huge difference you probably keep uh, like a Memnite over a reality chip um, on the on the draw on the play you probably keep some of these Esper Sentinels have not played against Crabvine much so hard to say exactly I also uh, had a had like a, a brain fog going on so you know you don't have to be that good at this game to to win when your deck is also cooperating with you which clearly my deck was cooperating with me today perfect I mean the reality is I don't know how they're supposed to win yep move back we're at 31 it's just we're we're so far ahead it's I think these matchups are great um and this kind of goes back to people being concerned about cutting the sanctifier in vec. like I don't think you need sanctifier in vec to beat dredge and crab vine I, th I just I don't think you need them um, yeah, cool. So we, we won, and I will see y'all in um, round seven for our win in it, which is pretty exciting. Okay, cool. So we are against Screenwriter NY, probably New York. Um, I am pretty familiar with the name, and I know they usually play Living End. So we know kind of what we're facing off against. Um, this hand is not going to beat Living End, I don't think so. So this hand, however, might because it's very fast um yeah so we just turn one cigar to aid see what happens they cycle and they have force negation because why wouldn't you have force negation <laughs> um but yeah so stoneforge mystic is a nice pickup of course drawing second cigar to Zane, you know one one good draw deserves another um and i play the cigar to aid because quite frankly it's just gonna be more important than uh that because um i want to the, the plan is actually to try to kill them uh last turn the turn the goal was to try to kill them in two turns with 
an Ink Moth kill from the hammer off of Sigarda's Aid. And so that's why we played out the Sigarda's Aid last turn. Because we're going to need to play out um, multiple white. We can also get a, uh, a hammer here, of course. But now we have, we have two hammers available. And of course, game one, they don't have Foundation Breaker, so the, the eight is safe as long as it doesn't get Force Negation. Um, they also only have two creatures in the yard, so it's not a gigantic clock if they do go off. Waker of Waves, all right, not, not my favorite. That card's stupid. <laughs> um, yep, yeah, so... All right, and they have the, the Shardless Agent, um, so they're going to throw everything in the trash they're gonna living end thankfully they don't have grief here as well they do unfortunately have a flyer so the ink moth nexus um can't quite get there except we do have the urza saga to go get shadow spear so we will force them to block with the curator at least and sometimes your deck just wants you to have it the second hammer should do it unless they have exactly blue card force of force of negation but we've seen a lot of blue cards in play, and we've seen a, a Force of Negation and another blue card. So it's not like we can play around it anyway, so we're just going to do the thing. Yep, get Shadow Spear, throw it on there, play the land, crack in. I'm just grabbing this so I can't possibly mess it up. We crack in, they block, we throw two hammers on it, see if it works. And it did. Hit. yeah casual casual 21 flying lifelink in fact cool all right so we uh we kind of stole that one um i think the matchup's better in games two and three so anytime you can get game one it's a it's a big big win so we will see in game two of my winning cool all right so let's see how we boarded real quick so we cut the asper sentinels because they kind of suck in the matchup. They're really slow, and also they're really only hitting off of um, off of the actual living end, and that doesn't matter. Uh, so we boarded out the Esper Sentinels, boarded out the Steel Shaper's Gifts, because we care more about getting disruptive pieces down than killing them immediately, because especially post-board, they have so many ways to interact. Um, we trimmed a Giver, because I don't think we need all three Givers. One is usually enough. They don't have a lot of answers to creatures. Um, we also boarded out one Memnite, um, one nettle cyst the reality chip because quite frankly the reality chip that's not what the game's about we did board in basically a million cards uh so we brought in the on the draw i don't like to ferry because he's i think too slow for the matchup and he can get force negation as well so on the draw and so this is something i'm trying because it's a slightly new configuration of the deck we brought in the two lavinias the three blacksmith skills the spell pierces of course, we brought in the Relic because it's a graveyard deck. And we brought in the um, the Hushbringers. I kind of like Hushbringer because it does stop Relic. It also stops Grief. Or not Relic, um, uh, Foundation Breaker. And so if you're able to get Urza Saga and then you play um, Hushbringer, then you can potentially get there. Um, it also stops Subtlety. Um, so a lot of, lot of good interactions there. I don't know if it's correct, but it uh it felt right so we we did the thing cool um yeah i mean this hand's great we're doing the thing um i know i said you want to be more disruptive but when you have a fast hand that also has spell pierce backup it's it's pretty hard to throw that back um yeah and so yeah play out the giver because next turn we can always play out the cigar disade and the hammer um and oftentimes they will foundation breaker on two. So if you can keep them from hitting your cigar to say, that's pretty, pretty big game. Okay. And so here, I think I'm actually supposed to play it a little slower where we just crack in with the Memnite and the giver and yep, just pass the turn because holding up the spell pierce is very good, of course. Um, and next turn, we can Colossus Hammer plus Spell Pierce. So if they do tap below two mana, then we're in we're in good shape. Of course, we could just die. Like <laughs> That is also uh, a thing. And so I think here, 
So it's awkward, right? Because if they have violent outbursts, then we can't hammer here because they just violent outbursts in response. Um, and then we can't spell pierce. Um, and so I think what I'm supposed to do is actually crack in for two. Uh, one on the giver, one on the memnite. Pass the turn. Then if they go for the combo, we can pierce. Um, if they have force negation, they have force negation. But um, I think it's correct. Yeah, so we do it this way because I guess it doesn't really make a difference. They cast Living End. We pierce. Um, unfortunately, I believe they also... No, they did not. Okay. Yeah. So we did get to crack in for 11 here, which is nice. Uh, but they also had the Force of Vigor, which, sure, uh, you know, <laughs> they also had Foundation Breakers. So I don't know, you know, sometimes there's not a whole lot of things you can do. This is also why I generally prefer the uh, the blacksmith skills to the givers in this matchup if I have to kind of skew one way or another because they will have a lot of foundation breakers and just things like that. Here I do think I'm supposed to be getting in with the giver as well just because holding it up I don't think is doing a lot and the reality is if they are going to flash in an endurance they're going to flash in an endurance. I don't think dealing one damage a turn is, is going to be what makes the difference. Um, I think my opponent probably played this very well, and they were likely just um, just kind of the first living end is a way to prevent me from killing them, and the second living end is going to be where they actually combo off. Yep, looks looks like it. So we don't get any creatures back. They grief our ornithopter because why not? And they also have uh, sixteen power in play, um, and so we're dead. We're 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 quite dead. We gotta send a message though. I, I got the Cauldra here because I think I board Cauldra out usually, and so I wanted them to be aware of Cauldra. <laughs> not a uh, not a lot of reason. We can't draw Cigar to Aid plus plus a hammer there because we only draw one card. Cool. So I will see y'all in game three, and let's see how that goes. All right. So we are back for the one for all the marbles where we can potentially uh, top eight, which you know spoilers we do. So I boarded out the Cauldra. The Esper Sentinels are still out. I boarded out the Hushbringer. Um, Hushbringers for the two Teferis. And we boarded in one of these Steel Shapers gifts. And I think this is probably the better configuration. Um, I don't think Cauldre is very good. I think I just didn't board it out. Um, but yeah. So let's see how this goes. This hand is excellent. This hand's excellent. As long as they literally don't have grief on turn one we get to Lavinia them on turn two. And the deck, they are very good at addressing like artifacts and enchantments. They are not very good at addressing um, creatures. So Lavinia is usually very difficult for them to beat. We get the Hollowed Fountain because our, our life total doesn't matter that much in the matchup. And if they Foundation Breaker the Springleaf Drum, we want to make sure we have that blue mana if possible. Worst case scenario, we can steal Shaper's Gift for a Paradise Mantle, play the Paradise Mantle, and then potentially set up double, uh, like, like blue-white the following turn off the Memnite. But they don't have Grief, thankfully. Um, and so we get to play out Lavinia, which is a very powerful play, especially if we're on the play. Um, and then we kind of go from there. We have double Spell Pierce, too. Like, this hand is excellent. This hand is everything we want. Foundation Breaker, yep, probably blow up the Springleaf Drum, which makes sense to me. All right, so, yep, we go ahead and place a Guard as Aid. Uh, we don't have to hold up Spell Pierce, of course, because they can't force a Vigor us because of Lavinia. They can't Cascade into a Living End because of Lavinia. Lavinia stops their whole deck. Like, she's, she's really absurd. If you hear some clip-clapping, that's just my, my dog. He's my, he's my favorite my favorite dude. Foundation Breaker again. Like a jerk. I'm just going to say it. Like a jerk. They're probably saying I'm playing Lavinia like a jerk. We drew a land, which is great news. Yep, so we uh, go get Paradise Mantle again because it's, it's just additional mana. We put it on the Memnite. And we crack in with the Lavinia and the Memnite. There's not a lot of reason to hold up the mana. 
um, because Foundation Breaker can't be spell pierced and Force of Vigor can't be cast currently for multiple reasons. Yeah, and so we're just getting in for three, three damage a turn because the reality is they can't... One, they're like missing land drops, so they can't living end us anyway. But two, they can't reasonably um, do much with Lavinia in play. So anyway, moving forward. What do we got? Cool. Waker waves, you got it. Things are looking very good. Perfect. So, yep. Cool. Second Lavinia, just in case, because I don't know reasons. <laughs> All right. It's a question of do you want to crack in with the Memnite? Do you not? And the reality is, I'm probably not supposed to, because then we can hold up Spell Pierce plus activate the Saga. But it doesn't actually matter that much because Lavinia neuters their deck so hard. See if Magic Online actually wants to catch up. Cool. All right. Yeah, so we'll get to make a 3 3 off of the Saga. Uh, they get to play Shardless Agent as a blocker, I'm guessing. But the reality is it does not matter. Yeah, so we make a construct here. And we're just going to go get a Shadow Spear and suit up the construct for lethal damage and that's how we made it to the top eight opponent definitely had some unfortunate draws but they also had double foundation breaker so i don't know you know how bad we can feel um but once again like lavinia just does a ton of work i wouldn't be surprised if they were sitting with like force of vigor in their hand but yeah i will see y'all in the uh the top eight match all right so i am glad i recorded everything kind of as i was doing it despite it almost breaking Moto, because Moto did not actually record um, all the games in this match. So we're going to go through a little bit differently than we have been. We're just going to be going through the replay. So uh, we are on the play. I know C. Carlson is on Amulet. Um, and yeah, so we look at the hand. Its hand is kind of sketch. So... Uh, we go ahead and keep and go ahead and just go plain Sentinel Memnite. The reality is if we are able to spike any sort of mana source, we do get to Paladin plus Hammer. So pretty good. Um, so we draw the Springleaf Drum and play the Hammer. Attack for one. They led with a pretty slow hand. Uh, so just Castle Grand Break tapped. They don't have an amulet. Usually if... Titan does not have an amulet. It is very difficult for them to win, especially against a deck like Hammer. Um, so that tells me they probably didn't know what, what we were on. Um, so they pay the mana for the Esper Sentinel. And then back to us. Um, so, okay, yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's keep it simple. We put the Hammer on the Sentinel because, I mean, quite frankly, 11, um, 11 is a lot to pay for a tax. Okay, so we crack in, kind of go from there. So we tank here for a while. Um, we decide to... Yeah, sorry I'm jumping around a little bit. This is a... Uh, the recording is being a little wonky. Um, and so yeah, we... Go ahead and move the hammer to the pure steel because the only way they can win is if they go Titan into like if they also have amulet, I think is what they need. They need amulet into Titan into haste attack um, plus some other stuff. Um, so there's this very little reason for us to not just keep the hammer on the paladin because then at least we get to eat the Titan. We can always move the hammer back on the following turn with the Pierce Steel Paladin. Cool. So Boros Garrison, Cavern of Souls, name Giant. All right, looks like they have a Titan. I'm surprised. Um, 
that being said, they still haven't tightened us. So yeah, just get to crack in. And we decide to crack in because attacking with the pure seal. Um, so we attack with everything, play out both givers. They have to block with the with the Azusa. We throw the Memnite away because we don't care. So we move the Colossus Hammer to the giver of runes um, and just pass the turn. Cool. So they tap all their mana to play a, uh, a Primeval Titan. I know. Shocking. And they concede uh, because they're they're dead on board. So we can actually watch a sideboarding real quick. So we are considering a few different things. The marches are great. The Lavinia's are great. The blacksmith skills are great. Um, the consideration is, do we bring in Hushbringer as well? We do have a lot of cards to bring out. Like the Nettle Cyst is bad. The Reality Chip is bad. The Esper Sentinels are quite, quite poor. Um... And so I was actually supposed to board out Giver here as well because Giver is just like very slow. Um, so we were supposed to board out the Givers instead of the Memnites for sure because the Memnites at least um, at least act as acceleration with the Drums of the Mantle. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we go with. Um, and uh, yeah, so I will come back when the round starts. Cool. All right, so here's our hand. Um, we don't have an equipment, but we do have multiple equippers, two givers, and a hushburner. Um, I think this hand actually kind of sucks. It's not very fast. It's R7. I absolutely should have mulliganed, but I chose to keep. Cool. So we keep. They mold. They, uh, they kept their seven, I believe. And, yep, they have double amulet, so we are incredibly dead. So it didn't matter what our hand was anyway, but I do think this hand was something we should have thrown back because it was just... Like, we don't have a Stoneforge to get a Cauldre into play. We don't have a Lavinia to stop them from um, casting, like, Force of Vigor or Pact of the Titan or a Pact of... The Green Pact, whatever. Um but yeah, so definitely something we should have just probably thrown back. We can do better on six. It's kind of what I usually tell everyone, mulligan more aggressively, but then I didn't mulligan aggressively because, you know, do what I say, don't do what I do. Not always. Perfect. So if they have a Titan, we are super duper dead. Cool. So they had Summoner's Pact, and now they have a Titan. Um... Pretty sure we're dead here. We did have the we did get to untap and play the Hushbringer, which is really nice because at least the Titan doesn't go get two lands immediately. So I'm thinking maybe Hushbringer is good enough in this matchup, but the rest of the hand was just not. Yeah. So pure steel and giver probably, and nothing matters. Yep. Pure steel. The joke is if we had actually had um, Giver or a, a March there, we could have pitched the Givers to the March to kill the Dryad, which would have been really nice. Definitely worth a couple of cards. Cool. So they got to play another Dryad, which is not great because they had the Summoners. Uh, they had to pay for Summoners Pact, of course. Um, but then they played a Bounce Land, played the Dryad. They get to crack in with this primeval titan and uh, kill us with the uh, the Valakut plan because they just get to replay Valakut or yeah they get to replay you know bounce land replay bounce land replay bounce land and kill us yeah so we will see you in game three and we'll see how that goes all right so we are back um, for the game three we're just seeing how we sideboarded. Um, and let's see if I correct it. Yeah, so we bring in the Memnites, bring out at least a couple of the givers, all the givers, um, and call it a day. I can see potentially keeping one giver because we only have three blacksmith skills now, but I think cutting all of them is completely fine. 
So what do we got? Uh, this hand's terrible. It's two Springleaf Drums, five lands. This hand is also heinously bad. Uh, so we'll go to five. Um, see if the opponent gets to keep their hand. They do keep seven, which is not a great sign. This hand also is just wildly unplayable. Uh, yeah, so so to four we go. All right, well, we have Stoneforge and some lands. So let's see <laughs> See if Calder can get there by itself. Uh, not not super hopeful, but you know we're we're down in ancestral recall. We bought him. We're trying to figure out what we bought him. It's definitely two of the lands. That part's easy. Um, and the reality is, it's probably blacksmith skill because if we hit um, cigar to Zade or potentially pure steel paladin, there is a world where we can equip a hammer. Um, so. Yeah, I'm tanking pretty hard on this because, you know, it's it's potentially the last game of the tournament, seeing how it goes. Um, I decided to bottom the blacksmith skill, which I think is absolutely correct. So we just go tapped land, pass. I'm, like, in reality, I was probably supposed to shock that in so they don't run out the amulet. But let's see if they have the amulet because we could be repping spell peers if we, uh, if we do. Just shock that in. Cool. All right. So the good news is they're leading with tapped Valakut. All right. Yeah. Well, Paladin's a good draw as well. Let's go Stoneforge. See if Cauldra gets us out of this mold of four. We're really hoping for a land here as well. Honestly, a uh, specifically like a Springleaf drum would be would be pretty nice um but really enters the saga would be the probably the best draw or a memnite would also be pretty good honestly so we'll see what happens though yep just pass the turn after we get the cauldra kind of go from there cool so they played urza saga and pass the turn um all right i mean we've got a shot if we get to cauldra them into Untap Cigar to Zade, Colossus Hammer, we probably win the game, but it's uh it's close. Alright, let's get in there. I mean if there's a there's a five we're winning with, it helps being on the play and it helps having this stone fortune to Cauldra. And kind of hope hope, you know, cross your fingers. Cool. All right, so Crumbling Vestige, they get green, and they play Azusa, which is not really what I want to see. Then we got a Radiant Fountain going, so that throws off our clock, which is unfortunate because otherwise they'd be dead next turn. <laughs> and kind of go from there. Okay, and then they played Gruel Turf, bouncing the... Um, the Radiant Fountain to their hand. So we did draw Urza Saga. It's tough, right? Because we want to pure steel. And we want to hammer. But we need to hit exactly a zero to move the hammer on. Um, we want to draw a card with pure steel as well. So it's really tough. I think what I was supposed to do here was play Saga. And then from there, play Aid. Throw a hammer on the on the germ or attack with both germ and stone forge throw a hammer on the stone forge um and crack in for 15 hope they don't kill us the next turn um instead i went with this line which was colossus hammer um i don't think this was correct in retrospect but we were also on a mold of four i think i was just supposed to be as aggressive as possible um obviously second pure steel paladin is not really what we're wanting to see here um but I mean, if we had attacked with Stoneforge and Cauldra and just put them to one, that might have done it. I don't think it does, but putting a, putting a hammer on the germ is also a reasonable thing to do. So ultimately, I decide I can't attack because the likelihood of them killing me is too high. Um, which, is that correct? I don't know. Doesn't doesn't feel super correct in retrospect i think i was just it had been a long day and i was supposed to be more aggressive than i was feeling um 
we're feeling a little beaten down by the the mole for sure. But they drew uh, they drew the amulet, which is not uh, not really what we want to see either. So they get to Titan, but this means they can't attack us. Um, so if if they uh, they they can't reasonably attack us because then always we can always just block with the Cauldra on the Primeval Titan. That being said, they can do they can just like go get besiege you, and then things are bad because we need the hammer to stick around. Um, I think it was probably correct to attack also because it's very difficult usually for Primeval Titan to do more than uh, usually like what sixteen damage in a single attack. So probably supposed to have just gotten in there with Phyrexian, thrown a hammer on it, fifteen them. Um, and then we can also block with the stone forge. So even if they can deal 20, we can always block. And then the following turn, we can uh, we can hope to spike something. Okay, so a few minutes later, they decide on Simic Growth Chamber and T-West. They go ahead, they're going to transmute their Tolarian West, I'm sure. Yep, so they're just getting a ton of mana. They can T-West, I believe, for a second Titan. Yep, so they're transmuting. Question is, what are they getting? They get Summoner's Pact, of course. Um, and then I believe they get Dryad here. Yep, they get Dryad. Play Dryad. And then they are going to ruin our day the next turn with um, Valakut. Yep, so they probably kill the Paladin here. Yep, that is the correct line. So the, the joke here also is that if we had, okay, cool. So they, yep, they besage you the saga. So if we draw a second hammer here, um, it has to be exactly hammer um, to win the game. We do get to, yep, draw, uh, draw the hammer, play the paladin, play the hammer, put both hammers on the, the German to go to town. But we draw Cigar to save. And so this, this game is unfortunately over and our run comes to an end. Uh, you know, Mold of Four always not really what you're looking for in your finals match. But it was a good game. Um, the first and second games were really interesting. I was surprised the opponent kept kind of such slow hands um, in the the third game at least. But a lot of times people do kind of rely on Baseju and Force of Vigor to get through this matchup and so that's one of the reasons one of the many reasons that i think cauldra is one of the best things you can be doing in uh in modern right now especially in hammer time yep and you get to see the concession just look in million valakut triggers and we are dead to the replays but ggs so i will uh, i'll be back for the the final debrief real quick all right cool so we are back with the debrief so honestly i think I still feel like the main deck is just about perfect. Um, I'm super happy with it. I like the very proactive approach of Seal Shaper's Gift. Um, like the Giver of Runes a lot because Giver into Stoneforge is still very powerful. Um, the things I might change. Hushbringer, I think, is still good enough because it comes in in a lot of random matchups like the just the pile decks. Um, it's good against a lot of the very elemental heavy versions. It's also insane, of course, against um Yawgmoth, right like that's the the match you really want the card for um the other thing that you really i think want right now is lavinia's insane as well she's she almost solo beats living end um as you saw there uh to fairy time raveler he's kind of the card that i care the least about um he's so expensive like three right but in this deck that's very expensive obviously he's very good against things like exactly blue white control um he's also good against the four color pile decks like the really controlling versions that being said um i'm fine with three blacksmith skills i kind of want the fourth again just because i think the card's 
really ridiculous, but I don't think there's quite the room for uh, four right now. And so what I do like doing is cutting the Teferi for another Lavinia. Um, I think Lavinia does everything you want right now with the exception of exactly bouncing like Chalice of the Void. That being said, you can always bring in March of the Otherworldly Light. I don't think you really should. I think you just kind of bring in against Blue White something like this and then some combination of Relic, March, Pithing Needle, um, and call it a day. That being said, I think Lavinia is really good. She's good against all the Cascade decks. She's good against Solitude, all the cards that are really good against us, Force of Vigor. Um, she's also very good against Titan. And so I think that's kind of the change I would make if I was to run this back. I think the deck's really good. Um, nothing too crazy, but I hope y'all enjoyed the the walkthrough. And if you have any questions, you know, of course, hit me up on Twitter. Um, uh, I'm probably going to be posting videos roughly every, like, other week i don't think there's a lot of demand for weekly content if there is let me know um i just tend to get burned out sometimes um, i'm also working on some other sweet decks with with a friend um so if y'all are wanting to see something other than hammer time i'm also happy to do that but yeah um in the meantime i hope y'all enjoyed you know like comment subscribe whatever all that good stuff and you know if you've got any questions you know always happy to help you know i'm just repeating myself so i think we're just going to close it out there take care y'all